Thank you. Good evening. And welcome to the Truman Library. I'm Kelly Anders, Deputy Director, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Matthew Algio. Matthew's latest book, When Harry Met Pablo, Truman, Picasso, and the Cold War Politics of Modern Art, will be released tonight here at the Truman Library. Matthew is currently an associate producer for National Public Radio, and he has reported from four continents from, for NPR News and other outlets. He is the author of six other books, including one of my favorites, Harry Truman's Excellent Adventure, The True Story of a Great American Road Trip, which was named one of the best books of 2009 by the Washington Post. In addition to reporting and writing, Matthew has held jobs as a convenience store clerk, <laughs> gas station attendant, Halloween costume salesman, and a hot dog vendor in a traveling circus, even though he's a vegetarian. <laughs> he holds a degree in folklore from the University of Pennsylvania. In his bio, he modestly says, I'm an award-winning journalist and author, but so is practically every other journalist and author. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Matthew Algio. Thank you, uh, Kelly. That was all the good bits were there. Took most of my shtick. Um, I'm actually going to take this out for a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> I, I really need to thank uh, Kelly, Azalea, Kurt, everybody at the uh, Truman Library, uh, not just for tonight, but for all the help they've given me in writing this book and in writing the earlier book, uh, Harry Truman's Excellent Adventure. It's uh, it's a joy to work in this space here and uh, with these people here. So I just want to say I, I, can't, I can't thank them enough. And the book actually, uh, the last book uh, I, I did, um, it was called All, All This Marvelous Potential about Robert Kennedy's 1968 tour of uh, Appalachia. And that book was released in March 2020 and then a, a global pandemic occurred. So, fingers crossed, in two weeks we will not have another global. I don't, I don't think it was my fault exactly. Um, I, uh, I, I learned about this story, and I've been very fortunate. My, well, my wife has a real job, um, and so I'm very fortunate to be able to write these books. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, my, my wife is a foreign service officer, and so we're overseas a lot. And so it's uh, difficult sometimes, but the people at the library here have always been very helpful in emailing files, making things available to me. I really uh, appreciate that. So most of this book was written while we were in Sarajevo, um, the capital of Bosnia. And uh, we just found out our next assignment. We will be going to Botswana. Does anybody know the capital of Botswana? Gaborone. Yes, give him a free book, not mine. Somebody else's. <laughs> All right. So I'm not going to ask any more geography questions tonight. I think we've got that covered. Thank you. Uh, yep. Yeah, we're doing all the bees. William Rockhill Nelson. I bet you guys know who William Rockhill Nelson is, right? Well, uh, he opened the first uh, art gallery in Kansas City. And what happened was Nelson went on a trip to, uh, the, uh, to Europe to do one of these grand tours in the uh, 1890s. And he bought a lot of reproductions of works of the old masters to bring back to Kansas City and open a gallery. Well, Harry Truman, uh, you know, when he was growing up in Kansas City, there really was no art gallery here to speak of. And so this was uh, Nelson's uh, attempt to, to finally bring some kind of art museum to Kansas City. Well, 
here I'll show you. These are the kinds of pictures that, that he brought back. Now this is a reproduction of, uh, don't make me say his name, Bartholomeus Vanderhelst. But these are the kinds of pictures that William Rockhill Nelson brought back for the Nelson Gallery, which was two rooms on the second floor of the public library. And this, I believe, was Harry Truman's first exposure to art, was pictures like this. They're very realistic, right? I mean, you can really, I mean, you can almost feel the breath when you're up close to them. And this is ginormous. It's like 12 feet across. So the Nelson Gallery was the first foray that Kansas City had into art, and really, I think, the first experience Harry Truman had with art. You know, Harry hated modern art. He hated it. But I think part of the reason was he just never really had any exposure to it. Um, because this was the prevailing, the prevailing art at the time. It really uh, was this way everywhere in the United States at the time. Museums displayed old masters, art that was realistic, that adhered to the long principles of perspective. Everything was exactly lifelike, almost a photographic reproduction of, uh, of, of what life is like. Now, America in the early 20th century was finally awakening to some of the trends that were occurring in Europe. And in 1905, Alfred Stieglitz, he was a photographer uh, in New York, and he opened a famous gallery there called 291. And he had a friend, Marius Desaius. Now, Stieglitz believed that photographers should be exposed to trends in modern art. He saw photography as a kind of art in itself. Now, there's a kind of ironic twist here because while you'll see uh, visual art painting is getting less realistic and more abstract, photography is going the other way. It's becoming more lifelike. It's taking pictures of unposed pictures of people in real life. But in a, same, in a way, they're kind of traveling the same, uh, the same road. So uh, Marius Desaius was Stieglitz's friends. He said, he said um, the, the Autumn Salon is occurring in uh, France in uh, 1910. You should go find some pictures that we can show here at the gallery in New York. So Zayas goes, um, goes to Paris and he sees the work of a Spaniard. He forgets his name, but he writes a letter back to Stieglitz and says, there's a Spaniard here who has some interesting pictures. And uh, Stieglitz says, well, you should go meet him. And uh, Marius Zayas and Picasso uh, both spoke Spanish, and so they started up a, a, a friendship. And Desaius uh, convinced Picasso to lend some of his works for an exhibit at uh, the 291 Gallery. And uh, here I'll show you one. This is uh, one of the pictures that caused the most consternation when this <laughs> when this uh, exhibition opened at 291. Standing female nude is a uh, early example of Picasso's cubism. Uh, I just need to read sort of what, here's what the art critic of the New York Globe said. Any sane criticism, I don't know why I use that voice. Any sane criticism is entirely out of the question. Any serious analysis would be in vain. The results suggest the most violent wards of an asylum. So he was not digging it at all. <laughs> of course, controversy like that, you know, it's one of, the, one of the times where bad reviews led to good attendance, right? There's no such thing as bad publicity. So the crowds for these, these shows that he had, the, the show he had at 291 were enormous. But at the end of the day, uh, the drawings were priced as low as $12, by the way. You get a Picasso for $12. Uh, but only two were sold. And uh, Stieglitz himself, he, he bought a uh, standing female nude for $65 and then hung it over his fireplace. So it took a little while for, uh, for modern art to catch on. In fact, it, it was another few years before the first uh, major exhibition of modern art occurred in the U.S. And 
This was in uh, uh, February, March 1913 at the uh, 69th Infantry Armory in New York. It's known as the Armory Show, but it gathered um, 1,200 works uh, by leading European artists, Duchamp, Batiste, Picasso, as well as a few Americans. And uh, this show became very famous because I will show you another nude. You don't have to cover your eyes. <laughs> I think he kind of stole that from Picasso, but Duchamp uh, named this new descending a staircase number two. Now, everybody, everybody was trying to figure out where is the nude in that? And I, I have to, some of the guesses were really good. Sorry, I did everything. Yes, I like this. Uh, the New York Times described it as an explosion in a shingle mill. <laughs> Others described it as undressed lumber, a pack of cards in a cyclone, a riot in a lumber yard, an Omaha woodshed after a big wind, a pile of disused golf clubs, an assortment of half-made leather saddles, an elevated railway station in ruins after an earthquake, and a dynamited suit of Japanese armor. So everybody wanted to know, where is the nude in that? And again, this, this controversy really increased uh, interest in modern art in the United States. What I found was interesting was there was actually a review of the Armory Show in the Kansas City Star. They had a a freelancer in New York who wrote a review and it was not very uh, it was not very positive he said you've heard of the cubists they're the Frenchmen who draw a hexagon and say isn't it a beautiful circle <laughs> and he said New York is laughing at them nobody takes them seriously and really this was the kind of writing that I think informed Harry's opinion of art and it was really the prevailing attitude at the time you know these 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 funny pictures and uh, even a five-year-old could, could draw them. I'll show you the next slide just to show. This was a, a, a takeoff on it that really uh, shows you how it sort of became a, a, a meme, you know, um, before we had the word. So the reviews of the uh, Armory show were, were not great. Um, and I, I, uh, there's a lot that happens in the 20s and 30s, of course, but moving ahead, the... the, the um, Museum of Modern Art is founded in 1929, and then of course uh, the Depression and uh, World War II intervene and really have a negative effect on the production of art for obvious reasons. And it's really after the Second World War, and of course Harry's president now, that uh, cultural diplomacy became a catchphrase, that America was seen as a country that you know, was uh, more concerned with money than art you know, more concerned with pennies than poems, that sort of thing. And so there was a, a diplomat at the State Department, Leroy Davidson, and he decided we're going to put together the most modern works that we can, and we're going to uh, take them abroad, and we're going to show people what freedom of expression means. And this would be a stark contrast to the prevailing art in the Soviet Union at the time, which of course was uh, Soviet realism, you know, the heroic depictions of the workers, that sort of thing. So Davidson, uh, he, he bought 117 oils and watercolors by American artists. There were two things that were unusual and ultimately controversial about the show. He called the show Advancing American Art, and the State Department bought the pictures. Now this is unusual, usually the pictures would be loaned. Um, but it, he, he argued that it would be much easier to stage a longer exhibition and have the government assume the cost of insurance and shipping and everything to just buy the pictures. Uh, the other unusual thing is there was no jury. Uh, Davidson himself picked the pictures. He was afraid if there was a jury that uh, they would default to the safest works, and he did not want this to be a safe show. Um, the, the, the show cost uh, $50,000 for the, for the pictures, which was a, a pretty good amount of money at the time. Um, I'll show you there. This is, the, this is one of the pictures from the show, which is, uh, really came to symbolize the show, Yasuo Kuniyoshi, uh, Circus Girl Resting. Well, there were other things going on in the world politically at the time. One was that Republicans were taking 
control of Congress back, and uh, they were looking to cut funding for the State Department, and this this uh, really became a political football. Uh, Look Magazine published an article uh, titled, Your Money Bought These Paintings, and, and published pictures of the paintings, including Circus Girl Resting Here. Uh, uh, there was a congressman, Carl Steffen, said, no wonder foreigners think Americans are crazy. Uh, he was the chair of the House subcommittee that funded the State Department, by the way, so his opinion mattered. He said he had received a lot of mail from constituents indignant about the exhibit. He quoted one correspondent who said the circus girl looked like a Chicago Bears tackle, taking it easy during a timeout. <laughs> Steffen said his constituents objected to, quote, any inference that the typical American girl is better equipped to move a piano than to play one. <laughs> so this actually reached up to the upper levels of the State Department, Secretary Marshall, and even Harry Truman uh, was forced to comment on it. And Harry, at a press conference, somebody showed him the Look magazine articles, and he pointed to this picture and said, this is what I mean by ha ham and eggs art. He said, I've been to a million circuses, and I've never seen a performer who looked like her. <laughs> so this became a political problem for, uh, for Harry. So the, the show opened to very positive reviews in Prague. It forced the uh, uh, Soviet Union to put on its own competing show. Uh, it was very well, well received, but uh, ultimately the po political uh, uh, implications were too much, and Secretary Marshall canceled the show had the pictures shipped back to the United States. He told Congress, as far as future circus ladies go, that is a closed shop. So the pictures came back to the US. They were sold as government surplus. And financial institute, or not financial institutions, educational institutions, uh, colleges and universities under the, under the rules of the auction were entitled to a 90% discount on the winning bid. So Circus Girl went to Auburn University for $100. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was sold for $50. So all of these pictures were sold for a fraction of, of what they were actually worth, which is, which is a shame. I just wanted to, I'm going to go to the next slide. I wanted to show the artist here, Yasuo Koniyoshi, uh, who, who painted the picture Circus Girl Resting. And a uh, little sidebar in the book uh, is his story, which I found really interesting. So he was born in Japan in 1889. When he was 16 years old, he moved to the United States. He wanted to learn English and then go back to Japan and be a translator. Uh, but he ended up in Los Angeles. He attended a public school. His teacher saw him drawing, said, you're really good. You should you know, take some classes. He took art classes in Los Angeles and then moved to New York and began his career as an artist. And he was a very successful artist. Uh, he was uh, one of the four Americans chosen to rep one of four artists chosen to represent the United States at the 1952 Venice Biennale. And uh, he he was uh, uh, one of the first artists to have a um, have a show at MoMA. He was included in the first show of American artists at MoMA. Uh, during World War II, he was declared an enemy alien. So the, the, uh, the way citizenship laws worked at the time, um, only uh, a free, white, f free white people and people of African descent were eligible to become citizens. So Japanese people, people born in Japan, were not eligible to become United States citizens. So he, uh, he volunteered for the, the War Department during World War II, helped write uh, Japanese propaganda, radio broadcasts, posters, etc. In 1952, the um, Immigration Act of 1952 finally lifted race-based restrictions. It went into effect in late 1952. He immediate, immediately applied for U.S. citizenship, but uh, he died three months later before his application could, could be approved. So he died stateless. Um, I should also mention his wife, uh, when he was married uh, in 1932, I believe, uh, his wife lost her American citizenship because a woman who married a man who was not eligible for American citizenship 
lost her citizenship. So his wife was stateless as well. Uh, I've, I really think it would be cool if Congress would give uh, Kuniyoshi a posthumous citizenship and uh, it would also, uh, you know, symbolically represent all the people who were born in Japan that were not allowed to become American citizens. Uh, not to go too far down that rabbit hole, but it's really fascinating reading the, the cases. Uh, there was a, a, a Japanese-born man who went to Stanford and then applied for American citizenship and went to the judge uh, you know, when the application, he appealed the denial of the application and went to the judge and said, look, my, my skin's whiter than yours. And the judge said, wait, that's not how we do it. That's not how we do it. And so it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided unanimously that no, it's not based on the color of your skin, it's based on the race Caucasian that is, as it is generally understood. And the guy who wrote the majority or the uh, unanimous opinion was a naturalized American. He was born in the <laughs> born in England. Anyway, it's a really interesting sort of sidebar to the story. And one of the things I love about doing these books is you find these fascinating stories that kind of get lost to history. And also one of the neat things about doing these little slice of life stories, you know, I mean, really we're talking about a day Harry Truman spent with Pablo Picasso, that in and of itself is not that fascinating, but the backstory I think is fascinating. And you know, the reasons it came about, why it happened, those sorts of things. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide and show you. This is Harry's kind of art. At the time the whole American, advancing American art controversy was going on, uh, Truman went ahead and spent, I think this was like $10,000 to buy this painting for the White House. And uh, that is, uh, is that Charlie Ross? Yeah, uh, his uh, press secretary pointing it out. It's called The Peacemakers by George Peter Alexander Healy. And it shows Sherman Grant Lincoln and Admiral David Porter. And uh, this, this I thought was interesting that in the midst of the controversy over circus girl resting, Truman bought this picture for the White House. So it's definitely indicative of where he was coming from. Now, I have to say, Harry, despite his dislike of modern art, he was not in favor of censoring modern art or you know, cutting fundings to museums. There was a movement in the United States, especially in the House of Representatives in the 1950s, led by a congressman from Michigan, George Dondero, who for some reason had a bitter opposition to modern art. And a lot of people on the right at the time associated modern art with communism. A lot of the people who were modern artists, you know, had funny sounding names. Uh, so they were immediately suspect. And really, I think they saw, or they said they saw, modern art as a way to sort of, a, you know, a Trojan horse for the communists to, to get infiltrate American culture and American society. Um, and, and so there was this really, a, throughout the 50s, this kind of uh, a, a backlash against modern art. Truman didn't like modern art, but he saw modern art had value. And I think he also appreciated the propaganda value of modern art abroad. I don't think he fought for adv advancing American art because he just, he, it, it was, boy, this guy had a lot on its table, right? <laughs> you know, 1946, 1947, Marshall Plan, we're rebuilding Europe. This was not a fight that Harry wanted to fight. But I really think he believed that there was a value in modern art. And it's interesting to note that the CIA in 1950 started a program. Uh, they had a front, the Congress, Congress of Cultural uh, Freedom, was it? They did this front organization that put on modern art shows all over Europe. And uh, it was all funded, of course, by taxpayers through the CIA. And that began during Truman's second term. So I was never able to establish whether Truman knew about this CIA modern art program, but I thought it was interesting that, that it occurred during his, uh, during his second term. Okay, let's get to 1958. So Harry and Bess are out of the, out of the White House now for five years. And uh, Harry still doesn't have a pension, still doesn't have social security, um, secret service. Um, 
I don't think he got Social Security either, did he? Uh, did he? Did he? Okay. Oh, that's right. Yes. And he got the Army pension too. Um, so it was a couple hundred dollars a month, I think. But he decided in 1958 that he was going to go on a cruise, a Medita Mediterranean cruise. And uh, <laughs> the, I, the, the woman who owned the cruise company was the widow of a former, his former ambassador to Norway. So they got comp the tickets. They got, didn't have to pay for the tickets. But uh, they decided to go on a cruise with their friends, um, Sam and Dorothy Rosenman. This is another one of those interesting stories. Sam Rosenman was FDR's White House counsel. And uh, then he was Truman's White House counsel. And then he kind of stayed on as Truman's uh, post-presidential advisor, really. He was his lawyer, and he had advised him on uh, negotiating the book deals and everything like that. So two, re two retired couples are going to go on this cruise. Um, and they decide they are going to do a Mediterranean cruise. So they'll go to Italy and France. Well, when Alfred Barr, who was the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art found out that Harry Truman was going to be in southern France. He thought, well, now I will finally convince him of the wonders of modern art. Alfred Barr, uh, another incredible, amazing figure in American art history, in American history, really, uh, 1929 was the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And he had long, especially when this controversy about advancing American art and Circus Girl Resting came up, he had uh, sent Truman a book about modern art trying to convince him uh, that there was value in it. And Truman sent him a very nice note back saying, um, I appreciate you trying to convert me to the modern viewpoint, but you won't. But Alfred Barr never gave up trying to convince Harry Truman about the merits of modern art. And when he heard that Truman uh, would be in the south of France, he decided, well, why don't we have Pablo Picasso convince him about the merits of modern art? And so Barr learned through a chain of uh, a, a sort of a game of telephone. Sam Rosamond was a law partner with Ralph Collin, who was on the board at MoMA, and that's how Alfred Barr heard that the Trumans were going to France. And so he decided to set up this meeting between Truman and Picasso. And I think it's really one of the, one of the best uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, what acts of diplomacy uh, that you could ever imagine convincing these two people with very different personalities and political viewpoints and philosophies uh, to get together. Uh, how he did it was pretty simple. He convinced Picasso that Truman really wanted to, to meet him, and he convinced Truman that Picasso really wanted to meet him. And I'll show you here, this is, uh, is kind of cool. This is the letter of introduction uh, that uh, I found, uh, actually, I believe it's in the, in the papers here, but the letter of introduction that Alfred Barr wrote for Truman uh, to give to Picasso. Very rarely do I agree to give letters of introduction to you because I know how distracting visitors can be. Yet I believe that you would be very pleased indeed to receive the two gentlemen to I've given this letter. And so this is the letter that uh, Barr gave Truman and he sent a, po uh, a, um, a, a copy of it ahead to Picasso and then he gave the Truman's instructions for, for how to get to Picasso's house and gave him his phone number. And it, it was really as simple as that. So on, on May 26, which is actually the day that this, this letter was written, uh, the Truman set sail on the Independence. So the SS Independence is the ship that they sailed uh, to, uh, to Europe. They were, uh, went to Naples uh, and, and then Genoa. They just did a night in Naples, I think, and then a night in Genoa. And the second half of the book is sort of a little bit like Harry Truman's Excellent Adventure Part Two. It's like Harry Truman's European Adventure. Um, so he, you know, he's always getting into these crazy, you know, crazy scenarios and everything. Uh, one of them I love when they went to uh, when they went to uh, Genoa. Uh, they accidentally crashed a wedding, and they went to the observation deck of the tallest building. 
uh, tallest building in Genoa, and there was a wedding reception going on. And so Harry, <laughs> Harry had his picture taken with the bride. I would have, I would have loved, I would have, want to read. It was uh, uh, Marissa Maffe and Tullio Vivaldi were the couple, and that is Marissa there. And the uh, Genoa paper the next day said, when Truman entered, there was a wedding celebration, and the former president of the United States, after having taken part in the celebration for some time wanted to pose for photographers with the bride and groom, who will thus have a completely unexpected memory of their wedding. <laughs> and they sent these pictures to uh, Harry and Bess and Independence after, uh, after they got back. And I looked everywhere. I mean, I tried to find this couple. And I was not, I just wasn't able to find them. Um, so if, if you have any idea where Marissa and Tulio are these days. I'd love to find out what happened, what happened to them. And really interesting, too, that they're getting married at a time uh, Italy's economy is just exploding. I mean, it was a great time to, you know, to be in Italy and uh, to grow up there, to be married there and start a family there. Uh, there was another interesting incident. After Harry went to uh, Cannes, uh, they stayed at the uh, Chateau Saint-Martin, which is in Vence, a small town. Uh, where the Matisse Chapel is today, and it's a it's a pretty high end. Uh, it's still there, uh, high end uh, resort hotel. Uh, so my wife and I stayed there for a couple days. Tax deductible, didn't have to pay. So research costs, research, and um, and and then from there they would go out. Uh, the the hotel supplied a driver, and uh, would would drive them sightseeing and stuff, but. They were in uh, Monaco. They were having coffee in Monaco. And uh, again, the, the archivist here, I, I don't even remember who it was when they knew, found out I was doing this, researching this particular trip. Uh, came, oh, here's a letter somebody wrote about who saw him on this trip. And it was a letter from uh, Robert Carlone was his name. And he was an Air Force captain. And he told this story about his, his father came to visit him. He was stationed in Spain at the time. His father was Italian and had never been back home. So he flew to Spain uh, to see his son and, and his son's family. And then they would drive from Spain to Italy to see his, see his family for the first time since he had left home like 40 or 50 years earlier. But um, by the time when they got to Monaco, the father wasn't feeling well. And so he laid down to take a nap in the hotel. And when Robert went to wake his father up, the father had passed away. So it's Saturday. Uh, they're in Monaco, and he alerts the authorities. And they say, well, the, uh, the undertaker is out of town until Monday. Uh, you, can, you can just keep him there in the room. <laughs> and the hotel was not air-conditioned either. And so... Uh, Robert Carlone uh, explained in this letter that he had sent to the library that he decided to walk, you know, walk to the American consulate and see if he could get any help. And as he was walking across the city, he walked past a cafe and happened to notice his former commander in chief and his wife having coffee just there in Monaco. And so he uh, stopped and introduced himself and explained the situation to. Uh, to former President Truman, and uh, Harry said, do you have a notebook or pen or paper or something? And so Carlone then gave him uh, paper and pad, and this is the note that Truman wrote. Honorable Harold Mosley, he was the US Consul. This will introduce Captain Robert A. Carlone. His father has just passed away. He needs some doors opened. Please help him. Harry Truman. <laughs> June 14th, yeah, so that's pretty cool. I mean, it's a terrible, tragic life event, um, but uh, effusive uh, Robert was in his, in his thanks for the, uh, expressing his gratitude to uh, Harry because he said if you, he walked up you know, to the consulate and handed this note and everything, everything got fixed. They found a, <laughs> they, they, they found a, 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 a funeral home that was able to take care of things. So it was just one of those interesting slices of life, you know, and death, I guess, that happened on the trip. So uh, 
Harry and uh, Harry and Bess and Sam and Dorothy then uh, were on the morning that they were to meet Picasso. They were having breakfast at the hotel, and then Harry got up. Uh, to go inside for a minute and the other three started quickly having a conversation saying should we really go to see Picasso because Harry doesn't like modern art and uh, Harry they came when Harry came back to the table they they asked him you know are you sure you want to do this and he said I'll behave he said he's the most famous artist in the world I want to meet him and so they went to Picasso's home in, uh, in the hills above Cannes and had lunch. And most of these come from uh, Dorothy Rosamond, fortunately, wrote her recollections of the, of the events. And after lunch, and uh, I don't want to give away too much, you got to buy the book. I mean, there's a lot of really, <laughs> really good stories in the book. But there is a point, there's a point during uh, when Picasso's showing, showing Truman around Picasso was kind of a weird dude, and uh, the house was a mess, and he had a, he had a pet goat named Esmeralda, and uh, he liked to do statues of the goat. He had a lot of very f funky paintings of the goat, and Esmeralda was allowed in the house. She'd go anywhere she wanted, and at one point, Harry, uh, Harry said to Picasso, uh, Esmeralda was out on the lawn and said, and there was a picture of her, like an abstract picture of her on the wall. And Harry said, you mean to tell me you took that beautiful animal and turned it into this? <laughs> now, Harry said Picasso just turned and, and, and walked away. But I, I don't think Picasso did that. I think Picasso probably confronted him a little bit. Picasso would love to tell the story about how GIs after the war uh, would come to his studio in Paris and he'd show them around. And, you know, he said some of them got it, some of them didn't. And, you know, he would show a picture maybe of Esmeralda and the guy, you know, the GI would say, well, that doesn't really look like a goat. Uh, but then Picasso would ask to see a picture of the GI's wife or his girlfriend. And he would pull a tiny little picture out of his wallet and Picasso would go, oh, but she's so small. Like, no, this is just a picture. She's not really that small. So you're like, oh, okay. So that, that's one way that Picasso, uh, Picasso made his point. So after they went, after they had lunch, uh, this is the famous picture of uh, Harry and, and Pablo shaking hands in front of his studio. They, had just, uh, they were only meant to have lunch, but Picasso apparently enjoyed the company so much that he offered to take the Trumans on a little tour of the south of France, taking, taking them to some of his favorite spots, which were all about him. Uh, so went to his studio, uh, went to the museum in Grimaldi where uh, a, a lot of his works were kept. And uh, this, this fortunately, I believe Sam Rosenman took this picture. Sam uh, had, a, had, a, had a camera and made uh, slides. And so he took uh, a lot of pictures on the trip. I actually uh, wanted to find out like, okay, if we could, if I can find Sam and Dorothy Rosenman's children or his grandchildren, you know, maybe they have some information about the trip. So I, uh, I did some research and I found that one of his, his granddaughter uh, is actually Lynn Garland, who is the wife of Merrick Garland, who is the United States Attorney General. So I was like, okay, well, I think I can find her. I think I can find her. And uh, I did get in contact with her, and she put me in contact with her cousin, who has all the slides that, uh, that they took. And he was very generous to let me use a few of the slides as photographs in the book. So they're really pictures that have never, never been published of, uh, of Picasso and, and Truman together. So it was really kind of a interesting. Part of the fun is you know, doing the research and, and, and finding, these, finding these connections. This is another picture that was taken in, uh, uh, this is actually at the m museum in, uh, uh, it's the Chateau Grimaldi. And that's Jacqueline Roque. Now Jacqueline was Picasso's, I don't know, what, would you, what would you say about that? That was not his wife, definitely not his wife. Uh, Jacqueline was the woman he was living with at the time. And uh, they were not married. Apparently, Bess was not too happy about that whole situation. 
But the funny thing is, when they went to the ceramic studio then in Valori, and, uh, and uh, Picasso told Bess and uh, Dorothy Rosenman, you, they, they had limited edition plate, plates that the, 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 um, uh, the pottery made, and he told Dorothy and Bess, you, each of you, take, take a plate, take, take one home. And uh, apparently Bess picked like the most like psychedelic weird one. And uh, Dorothy later said, Bess, why did you take that one? That's really one of the strangest ones. And Bess said, well, if I'm gonna have a Picasso, I'm gonna have a Picasso. <laughs> so she kept the plate and um, uh, Clifton has it now. Clifton has it and and the Rosenman's plate is still in the Rosenman family now, so maybe they'll put them on, uh, put them on eBay someday. Uh, just another photo, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, this is the trip home, and I just love this photograph. One of the cool things was, uh, the, in the, in the Truman papers, they saved all their uh, menus and programs, everything from the trip, there's like three, thick files of the 1958 Europe trip. And uh, in there, they had the passenger manifests for both the Independence and the Constitution, which was the ship they took home. And in there, they listed uh, the names of the children and the ages of the children. So what I did is I tried to track down some of the kids who were on the boat that remembered uh, meeting Harry. And this is, this is one of the families that uh, I was able to track down, it's the Hoos family, H-O-O-S-E, and uh, they, the picture, I guess, is available. Uh, this was their copy of it. Uh, so it's Linda and Frank Hoos Jr. with Harry during a lifeboat drill on the Constitution. And in the background on the right are the children's parents, Harriet, who's holding Tom, and Frank Sr. So Harriet would walk the baby uh, on the boat every morning and uh, Harry would often join her. So the, the mother and uh, Truman had struck up a friendship on the boat because Harry, of course, loved his morning walks and he maintained that even when he was on the, on the ship at sea. I just wanna show one more, just showing off a little bit. There we go. <laughs> I'm wearing the same shirt. That's why one good shirt. My one good shirt. So I, I was able to go down to uh, uh, Auburn uh, last, uh, last fall, and uh, I kind of have a crush on her. She was in storage, but they brought her, they brought her out so, so I could see her. So she's still in good shape. She actually got stolen. Uh, kids, uh, well, presumably kids stole it, uh, stole the painting in, I think, 65 or 66. And uh, basically the police chief said, first of all, it's like one of the most famous paintings in, <laughs> you know, just it had been 10 years since it was in all the papers. And the police chief said, uh, just leave it at the football stadium if you took it. And they <laughs> went the next day and there it was. So <laughs> I guess they learned their lesson. So she's back safe now, back safe in Auburn. I, I believe she's I believe she's on display uh, back, back in the gallery, which is good to see, too. And uh, that's, oh, you know, those are some blurbs I got for the, for the book. I think, I think we have just a couple minutes for questions. I went longer than I thought. If anybody has any questions, we can, we can do. We don't have to, sure. <laughs> what did Harry and Pablo think of socialist realism art? Uh, I don't know, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think they both hated it. Uh, it's really interesting, and I go into the book. Again, I can't tell you how interesting this book is, really. Uh, but I, I go into the whole, the Soviet Union was really like a, a, a melting pot for modern artists in the early, like the first two decades of the 20th century. A lot of like amazing art came out of the Soviet Union, but then when Stalin came in, he thought, you know, any picture, every picture had to have a person, preferably me, was Stalin's attitude. So, 
you know, I guess they would show Stalin a picture. He'd say, where am I? Uh, so they started doing a lot of pictures of Stalin. So it's a really interesting, it's really an interesting period of, of history and of art history. I don't think they'd like it. Yes? So uh, how did the meeting go? Were they able to change each other? Right. Well, again, I, I defer to the book. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I know, I, I will say this. When, when Harry uh, said that he had uh, met with Picasso, he told reporters on the boat home about the meeting. And the reporters asked him, said, are you, are you going to invite Picasso to the United States? And Harry said, we do not invite communists to the United States. <laughs> there was also a, there's also a good story in there. There was a, 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 a guy who was a, a, a professor at Roosevelt University in Chicago, and he heard Truman was going to meet with Picasso, and he wanted Picasso to, to paint a mural at Roosevelt University in Chicago. And uh, he asked Harry if he would ask Pablo if he could come to Chicago and paint a mural here. And... Uh, uh, afterwards, uh, Truman sent him a letter and said, I don't know why a university would, named after President Roosevelt would want to hire a, what do you call him, a, 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 a communist caricaturist instead of one of our great American artists. So Harry, Harry's opinion of, of modern art did not change. But Harry enjoyed uh, Picasso. Um, he said he had a good time. He said it was a lot of fun. He said, short, bald guy, a lot of fun. Um, it's not that much shorter than this, by the way, was taken in front of the, uh, his ceramic studio, which has been abandoned and is behind fences and barbed wire. And they're trying to get the money to, to restore it. So hopefully that'll happen. Yes. 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 Yeah, so the road trip that Harry and Bess took that I wrote about so well. <laughs> he, about what, I'm sorry. Right, 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 yeah. So the question is, Harry took this road trip in 53 and didn't think people would recognize him. I think by 58, he, 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 he was a little more prepared for that. And in fact, uh, he had worked with the State Department. Uh, the president travels on a diplomatic passport, so protocol is that you always advise uh, the consulate or embassy in the city you're going to. So there was advance notice of this. It wasn't like he was um, trying, to, trying to go incog, like he said on the first trip. In fact, it's interesting, uh, another cool thing they did for me here, they brought out his passport that he used for this trip. And one of the interesting things about it is Bess is on it. Bess didn't get her own passport. She's on the amendments page. And uh, I have a, pictures, pictures of the passport uh, in the book. But generally, uh, at the time, husbands and wives would have a single passport. Yes, one more. No, there was no, uh, the question is, was there, you know, she, you didn't see any secret service and there was no secret service on this trip. That didn't come in until after the Kennedy uh, assassination in 63, so they had no security to speak of. Although it was a little bit like Harry Truman's excellent adventure when the mayor of these towns would hear that Harry Truman was there, they would send somebody just to keep an eye on him. Like, don't let him die here. <laughs> yes, one more. Did they, did they exchange gifts? That is a question I was not able to answer. And I, I, I'm, you know, I know that Pablo gave them the plates, uh, uh, Bess and Dorothy, but whether the Trumans took anything to give Picasso, I don't know, I'd love to know. I guess, you know, if I, if I see Harry in the hereafter, <laughs> I'm gonna ask him that, and he's gonna say, why the hell do you wanna know that? Why were you writing these books about one day? It's crazy. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's really, it's just wonderful to be here. Thank you so much.